In this video, we will identify how we can analyze a single athlete, so n equals one, to determine if they've improved from one testing battery to the next. And this video will be based on this paper here, which I will put a link to in the description. So this is what we're aiming to produce, albeit you can make it look way better. And I'm gonna provide the backdrop to all of this data as we go. And actually, all of these tables are the same thing. Which one you use will just come down to your preference of what data you want to have identified on the sheet. Okay, so we have the athlete's jump height at time point one and again at time point two, so in a follow-up test. And the question is, did they get better? And unfortunately, we can't just look at the raw data as it contains some error that we have to account for. Remember, no test is perfect. So normally in group level data, we would aim to determine the trial to trial and day to day variability in our test score using the coefficient of variation or the standard error of the measurement. And let's say that that equates to 2% or two centimeters. Well, then crudely put, we can't categorize any change as real unless it's greater than this value. Now, when we're looking to do likewise in a single athlete, we just need to use the standard deviation, which is actually at the very heart of the calculation for the uh, CV and the SEM. And again, all of this is explained in more detail in that short paper. So what does the standard deviation tell us from a testing standpoint in a single athlete? Well, the standard deviation represents the spread of data around the mean and so a small standard deviation represents data that is more closely clustered around the mean and it tells us that the scores are are similar and thus quite consistent a larger standard deviation on the other hand suggests a lack of consistency and and that's a a lack of accuracy in the in the test data so if we compute the the standard deviation across at least two trials, we can see how consistent our athlete is. And although we typically report the best score, that single time point estimate likely represents an over or underestimation of the true score and how much it's off by is determined by, by the variability in data points, again represented here by the standard deviation. So here we go then with the crux of the, the video. What we can do is still report the best score, but discuss improvements based on the likely range of scores that are compatible with our athlete's performance during that test on that day. So while this athlete's best score is 43.7 centimeters, the error based on one standard deviation suggest it could actually be between 42.6 centimeters and 43.9 centimeters and and why is that useful well we can use that range and the range in any follow-up test to analyze a single athlete to determine if they improve stay the same or somehow manage to get worse and we do that by identifying if the confidence intervals overlap or not. Now the width of that range will depend on how confident you want to be that you've captured the athlete's true score. So by using just one standard deviation, we account for 68% of the variability. That is, if our athlete was to do 100 trials, we would expect 68 of them to land within that range. If instead we built a range of scores around the mean using around two or three standard deviations, then we would expect 95 or 99 trials to land within that range. But as we'll note, as the intervals increase and our confidence therefore grows in us actually having captured the true score, the opposite happens in the likelihood of us being able to identify small but potentially meaningful changes. So our choice of confidence interval should be based on a desire to avoid type one or type two errors, which in turn is based on the consequences of being wrong relative to missing those small changes. And as I explained in the paper, 
when it comes to high performance sport, I prefer to avoid type two errors. So I think one standard deviation is fine. So let's now walk through the analysis. Well, again, it's a good idea to obviously calculate the standard deviation and you can see the formula for that in the formula bar. And for example, if one athlete is much higher than, than everyone else, then they need to spend more time learning how to perform that test. As until then, the intervals will be so wide that it's going to become quite difficult for us to detect any meaningful change in and amongst all of that noise that they've generated. Alternatively, if you note that everyone's standard deviation is high relative to their mean, then you should question the validity of the test for monitoring purposes. Perhaps you're better off just, just binning it. So next we report the, the best score. And if you want to, the lower limits and the upper limits. So again, that's just the average minus the standard deviation or alternatively, the average plus the standard deviation. We have the same again at testing point two. And so therefore we can use this if function here to see if the intervals overlap or not. And I'll make this Excel sheet available online so you can grab it and have access to the formulas, assuming you think useful. I'll again put a link to it in the description. Now, moving to the table below, I did exactly the same thing, but didn't bother to write out the values for the upper and lower limits. But that does mean that the if formula now is way longer as so I've just calculated it as part of that. And also hook this table up to these boxes here. And in this one here, you can widen or shorten the intervals as you wish. Of course, this will determine the number of times you identify an athlete that, that got better. And as you can see, that's done using the, the count if formula. So I'll just play around with, with this variance here to show how, how that changes. And actually this box here, which links to this one, it just shows the percentage of squad that, that got better. So this relates to one standard deviation, as you can tell here. If I change that to 95%, which relates to two standard deviations, you can see that the number of athletes that got better dramatically drops, as does the percentage within the squad, obviously. And I've only really put this for illustrative purposes. You might choose to not even bother to, to show that on your uh, data. So finally, again, for illustrative purposes, I've added this uh, column here, which is the raw difference between best scores. And I'm doing that just to reiterate a key point. So check out this athlete's data. How can such a big change in these scores, in these raw scores, still see an overlap between testing session ranges resulting in the athlete being classed as physically the same in the follow-up test. So here we have it here. Well, check out the standard deviation. It's way higher than everyone else's, and thus the test is not yet sensitive enough for this athlete. Or we didn't notice a fall or a lack of effort during the trials. And I suspect the latter, because when you look at the standard deviation from the first test battery, well, it's actually pretty good. So this is just something that you need to be aware of and manage during the session. Right, in this table here, I just wanted to point out that this can all be done in just a single athlete across multiple tests and across multiple time points. You just cut and paste as you, as you need. And finally, then down to this table where what I wanted to show is how you could set a target for your athlete if you really wanted to. And you would do that using the initial testing battery. And for this, we would just use two times your uh, chosen standard deviation. And the second standard deviation is used to account for the error in the follow-up test. And actually, we can just quickly note that two standard deviations produces 95% confidence intervals, which we noted when I, I plugged that in earlier, which is what's used to infer change in statistical significance testing. 
But anyway, moving swiftly back. But whatever target value you settle on, the reality is that scores above or below this preset value could actually induce a score that would be classed as, as better. And we'll never actually know until we make a comparison with the second testing session and its associated standard deviation value. Right, well, thanks for listening. I hope you found the video useful. Remember to read the paper if you haven't done so already, as it will explain a lot more and provide more context too. And here is a link to another video I made on confidence intervals and using different types of distributions based on sample size.